2024-2025 academic year. Congratulations, everyone being here. Uh, we will go ahead and get started with roll call. Roll call for the new counselors. You will just, we'll go around the room, state your name, present, um, just verbally, and then we will document it on our side, so. Matthew Rathbun, present. Levi Chi, present. Siobhan McKinney, present. Uh, Andre Casillas, present. Michael Warner, present. Susana Villagomez. Keely Glass, present. All right, thank you. Um, just a note, as we are in this room, we will be getting shuffled quite a bit for this fall semester, just due to room reservations and timing and everything. So we'll either be in 400 or 424. Um, this room, I don't really know where the microphone is, so if you can speak a little bit louder and clearer, just so we can have it. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's Wi-Fi or microphone or not. <laughs> um, cool. Does anyone want to read the mission statement? We will start off every meeting reading off the mission statement just to ground us and remind us of why we're doing this work. I can read it out. Carson, go ahead. To support the evolving needs of the MSU Denver students by advocating in their best interest to enhance the university experience and opportunities. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, first up on the agenda, we do have Vice President of Student Affairs, Dr. Will Simpkins. And Friends. <laughs> Friends. Yes, floor is yours. All right. Uh, hi. It is so good to be with y'all. First meeting. Um, I'm Will Simpkins, Vice President of Student Affairs. I'm Zach Grimson. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for AAC, the Atlanta campus. And Jim Carpenter, who is MSU Denver's Chief Financial Officer, is probably joining us. I saw him out on He's a call. Okay. So um, thank you for giving us time at your very first, first agenda item on your very first meeting. There are some things in movement right now that we wanted to get an early um, sense from you of how you respond to some opportunities that, that Zach, Jim, and I are seeing. And so I, I want to frame this as we're going to um, we're going to throw four things at you that we are actively working on, thinking through, dealing with that um, if we did all four would dramatically change the campus experience for students on the Auraria campus. It involves housing, it involves food, it involves RTD, it involves the Tivoli. Um, and likely would involve, at least a couple of them may involve referenda um, uh, that we would need to put through, of course, the university policy and fee process. But um, this is my seventh year at MSU Denver. Uh, hey, Will. Hey, Will. Um, got a little shtick. Uh, seventh year at MSU Denver. Since I've been here, what I would say is um, I've heard some pretty consistent themes over the years from students. Number one, a dissatisfaction with the quality, quantity, and diversity and affordability of the food that we have available on campus. Anybody disagree? Great, that helps. Um, concerns about overall fee structure and do students pay too much in fees, especially when you add up tuition and fees. So that's always in our head. And then we know Denver is getting more expensive. And so housing for many of our students is a real concern. So um, let me, should we start with RTD? I mean, it's everyone's favorite topic. It's my favorite topic. Yeah. Let's start with RTD. Yes. Um, do you want me to get into the proposal, yeah. the I think uh, let's start with how we got to where we are this Absolutely. year yep. and then what we could do. You bet. You bet. So um, we have attempted to work with RTD quite a bit over the last you know few years. And if we think chronologically, we were in a place where you know all students paid a mandatory fee and as a result had an RTD pass to use. We then went away from that in the midst of COVID and now um, we have over the last few years offered what's called a college pass. And the college pass is a program in which students can elect to purchase it, but are not mandated to purchase it. So if you want it, you can go to the ID station in the Tivoli and you can purchase the pass. The rate for that was never set by MSU or AAC or CU Denver or CCD. It was set by RTD. They set the fixed price for that contract. And when we were in the midst of COVID, and I don't want to get too detailed here, right? But when we're in the midst of COVID, ridership was really low, obviously. And so the way RTD sets the rate is based on how many people ride, determines what they actually charge. And so two years ago, we had a very, very low fixed price contract from RTD, roughly $150,000 for the entire campus to pay, which meant that 
um, we actually covered that cost and students could get a semester pass for free or college pass for free. Last year, uh, coming out of COVID, ridership was higher. And so RTD offered us the college pass. Uh, and that was a $890,000 fixed price contract, roughly. And so what we did is decide what is the rate that we could charge for that pass to break that cost even. That's where last year, any student that wanted to purchase a college pass with RTD would pay $150 per semester to ride. This year, RTD came back to us and said that program is no longer $890,000, it's now $1.95 million. And so that was a roughly 120% and costs for the campus. In addition to that, the Colfax line is shut down for maintenance um, and ridership numbers are just low. Even though we had the pass last year that we offered for our know, semester, roughly 4,700 passes were sold, which means we didn't even cover our cost. Ridership is down. And so because of that, what we did was work with RTD to offer a different option, which is called semester pass. The semester pass allows a student to go into the ID station and purchase a pass if they want. Uh, RTD charges us $70 a month for that pass. We then charge $50 a month back to the student. So we end up subsidizing $20 per month per student from AHEC itself. Uh, and that was based upon reserves that we had set aside with RTD. So I think that the moral of the story, the net of the story, right, is RTD um, sets, that, sets that fixed price contract for us. We have no control over what that is. And we're seeing just low ridership numbers for a variety of reasons. One, stations are closed. Two, lines are being closed. Three, there's massive delays. There may be potential security issues down different lines. So I mean, ultimately, we're trying to figure out, like, do students still want to have a pass option as it relates to RTD? And we'll track the ridership numbers as we go through this year and then figure out next year what is the ultimate option that we want to look at for RTD. Yeah. So one of the questions I want to put on the table is, what do you feel like is the appetite? So obviously at $250 a semester, right? Um, now it's it's the highest that it's ever been since I've been here. When I first got here, I believe it was, uh, or when we ended the last, everyone pays the same amount. It was 135 Correct. for a semester, but every student paid that and every student got a pass sort of automatically. Um, what, what's your sense of the appetite of going back to a model where every student pays a fee, which then drops the price down dramatically, and it could could go even lower than 135, um, but everyone gets an RTD pass. Because if we did that, we would have to go through the referendum process this year. I think that is something, um, I apologize for being late, everybody, but it was good to be with you all. Um, I think that is something that students definitely are very much interested in. Even when I was um, campaigning, running, talking to people, they were like, what happened to the RTD passes? Uh, and, and so I think they are important to people, um, especially folks who commute, which is a lot of our students. Um, and so I think it increases access. I also think it would be the opportunity to increase retention. I know some folks who have to move outside of Denver because Denver is very expensive and rely on maybe the rail down south from mineral um, and cost is definitely a barrier. And so I think that it is something that is top of mind for students and top of mind for some of the counselors here as well. Others? You hit it right on the head. I mean, I agree with her overall what she said. I mean, a lot of people, um, like the number one issue for a lot of commuters uh, coming here is just the traffic for Denver. There's yeah. just too many people on the highway. And any time before or after seven you go on the highway, you're pretty much going to be there for at least an extra like half hour to an hour. And a lot of people who like live in Castle Rock, live in surrounding areas, they take their light rail when they can. And if they can, they usually uh, drive last. Yeah. How many of you use RTD to get here from the campus? Um, how many of you, if you had a pass that was a hundred and let's say thirty dollars, you would use the RTD? A dry plus. Um, frame any questions around RTD? I mean, I think these are the question. I think the question really is for those of you. The question is about the the the. the let me stop. I'm Jim Carpenter. I'm a CFO, and I can never remember to put on my little name tag. <laughs> um, so um, uh, the the question that I that I wrestle with is 
um, there was a move away from a mandatory fee uh, a few years ago. And so it, it, um, I certainly hear the appetite for having an RTD pass. I guess my question is around the appetite for a mandatory fee that would that, that would be necessary to support that. Because I mean, that's, you know, that means that the folks who are not using RTD are going to be paying that fee. And you know, I, I want to I want to make sure we're hearing the voices of the people who are going to be paying the fee if this is something that we're that we're considering. So that's the some of us are concerned about the quality of the product. Um, RTD has been atrocious this last couple of years between the random closures. Uh, a couple of weeks ago when we had our mandatory training, I went, I walked to the closest light rail to me. It was running every hour. I had enough time to walk back home, change my shirt, get in the car, and I parked about two minutes before the train would have gotten there. And I live off Colorado. And again, the closures and stuff, that's more my concern with it. So uh, my concern is kind of around safety. The RGD places around campus, especially, are not safe. Like I took RGD for the first two years of my campus and I live an hour away. Um, my concern is, if we all have this pass, I mean, I just don't think those areas are safe. Union Station, especially, that bus station, but scary. So that that would be my concern. Also, with this 130 bucks you said per student be and and don't hold me to that number. Yeah, no, yeah. throwing no, out an example. Yeah, would that be covered by financial aid? Yeah. So anything that goes on to your um, student account is is uh, and when we say covered by financial aid, it's assumed to be part of your educational expenses. And so it, if it's on your student account, that means your grants and scholarships and Pell Grant and things like that will cover that. And so it doesn't. Right. Last question. I assume because AHEC is here, is this just something MSU is considering? Or is this something CEO or Dever or CCD is considering? Well, so, so there's two answers to that. Traditionally, I'm going to get in trouble with my friend here. Traditionally, we've always done this with AHEC. Right. The AHEC is the holder of the contract. We work through AHEC. That does mean to do this, all three schools would have to do the same thing. And so I think what we're trying to figure out collectively is you know, for me, my concern is what's right for MSU Denver students and what, how do I go into meetings with my colleagues and represent your voices and your needs? And then we try to creatively figure out within the parameters that are set, how do we do that together? And so that was a very circular way of saying, maybe. I, I would feel more comfortable if all three schools kind of involved. A, I think a little less of weight. Are you, were your calculations just for one school or all three? It was all three. Oh, okay. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. All three. I'd, I'd hope then all three schools would kind of pitch in on this cost. Yes. So I'm going to move us beyond RTD, but here, here's two follow-up um, actions that I'd like for you all to think about. One, talk to your friends and, and reach back out to me and let me know what, what you hear from other students. Two, as you all are talking with the other student governments at CCD and UC Denver, um, I think Chat with them, to your point, Mike. See what the appetite is from their perspective. Um, I will tell you, two years ago, CCD was just flat against the, the mandatory fee model. But I'm hearing things now that lead me to believe they might, they might be open to it again. So stuff changes pretty often. So this, yeah, sorry. I'll... Well, I was sorry, everybody, for being late. Um, but I just want to say that most students are already talking about it. Like, yeah. it's, not, it's not like having to ask them if they want it or not. Yeah. It's like a necessity. This is a commuter campus. So for the uh, for students to be able to even have the ability to have that as a backup plan is kind of the reason why we are a commuter campus. Like yeah. students have already been, I guess, not distraught, but as it's difficult for them because they have to spend more money, money that they don't have on this pass. So most students already want the pass. And it's been talked about it since they got dropped. Like students have been upset since then. So I would go for it. Thank you. Um, although I, I I would benefit from the mandatory um, pass. Um, but um, what about, say like 90% of the students need the pass and they get the pass. So how, how do you um, benefit the 10% the that don't need a pass because they live right across the street or in the surrounding um, um, dorms. 
know, when they go to the stores yeah i mean in this area yeah i mean i think they still get the pass they can still use it it's not just uh for commuting to and from school so they could use it if they're going somewhere else on the weekends but there are probably even a larger than 10 percent of the students who are never going to use the pass who are never going to activate it never use it but they would still pay the fee um, and that's i think the crux of the question is do we ask everybody to pay a little so that we benefit maybe 50 percent 60 percent of students or do we keep it on a more expensive option for those who need it that's sort of the question and, and one other thing too sorry will is like if we have more ridership it's going to free up probably easier ingress and exit of the campus because there's more parking spaces yeah. for people that are actually driving down because people are taking rtd so it may help reduce some of the congestion that we see on a day in day basis no doubt this week has been incredibly busy for students trying to get in and off this yeah. campus can, can i suggest one thing that we can do together is potentially um depending on how the timeline works would TSAC be interested in maybe running some focus groups Absolutely. with us of, of bringing students together to have conversations? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. It would also be great to show a demographic why it would be beneficial because, like, if you go to the RTD mm -hmm. app, like, monthly is $88, it used to be $65, yeah. 19 and under. Yeah. yeah. And, like, that's about like $500. Like for the whole semester, like if we show the difference to students, like why this is beneficial, I think it's most likely like they'll agree with it. Okay. Great. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna push over to some some other topics. So um, I'm gonna describe a, a housing project that we're currently looking at, and then I think it's important for you to understand that first before we talk about the food services thing because they're sort of connected. So um, we have been for the last ever since I've been here talking about. Um, should MSU Denver get into the student housing business? We don't own and operate any housing right now. Uh, we have moved from trying to have good relationships with the off-campus landlords, so mm -hmm. the, the Regency, um, CoLab, mm -hmm. Raria Lofts. Any of you live in any of those buildings? You live in one of them? I did. You did? I used to. I did. I used, I used to. to. Okay, so, so we try to have good relationships there. Then. Two years ago, CU Denver actually started allowing MSU Denver students to live in their buildings. And you live in Lynx Crossing or City Heights? I know people. You know people. So this year we've got about 370 students, in, uh, mostly in Lynx Crossing, a few in City Heights. Mm -hmm. That's huge. And that's with very little marketing um, because we don't get those beds until late in the year. Typically a school, you know, you would apply in October and we would market housing to you when you're applying as a freshman or a transfer student. Um, we have an opportunity uh, with a developer right now on a project that we're looking at on the ball field lot, which is that big gravel lot next to the Tivoli garage between the Tivoli and the, and the hotel, to um, potentially build 515 beds of student housing. Uh, we're, uh, the the um, AHEC offices would also be in the building and the C2 hub would move into the building. We got some state revenue last year uh, to build the C2 hub. Um, the housing would be really similar in, in terms of cost to what CU Denver is doing right now. And I want to say all of us want to build affordable housing. We, we can't do that unless we have a billionaire who gives us a lot of money, and buys down the cost, or until we get to a certain number of beds that allow us to have some expensive options and some less expensive options because at the end of the day, it all sort of washes out. Are you with me so far? Okay. So right now we're looking at uh, 515 beds. 80% of the rooms would be uh, like a, a room with a bathroom and two beds. Some of them might be singles. Um, we, we charge you more money for that though. Uh, and some of them would be sort of suite style, two bedrooms with, uh, with two beds in each. So four people with a common area and two bathrooms with some amenities, but right here on campus. Um, the cost would be right in line with where CU Denver is, so no more expensive than CU Denver because we want to keep it competitive. Uh, likely would have some sort of meal plan just like CU Denver does, um, but it would be on campus. So I'm going to stop there and say, what questions do you have about that? And we're looking at like a two to three year timeline. Is the overall tuition going to increase for all the students or just the students that are going to be living in there? So uh, I'll answer that question in two ways. 
um, tuition and housing are not connected. And so the, the business model of student housing, it has to run on its own. Um, we've been really clear that like we can't, we don't want to divert university resources uh, at, a, at that level to buy down the cost because um, it's just not fair given the numbers and, and for our budget model. Is that fair? Okay. Um, so it has to be the, the, the um, contract, the housing contract cost um, with the meal plan cost has to, has to pay for it. Do you have rough numbers on what CU is charging right now for yeah. like that competition? Yeah, it's, is all that looking at? It's, it's all online. online. Yeah, it's, um, oh gosh, and I can't tell you off the top of my head. I know the dining plans, the, the most expensive one is about $5,400 for a year, um, for the year. And that's with like unlimited, you know, eat as much as you want, whenever you want, essentially in their dining hall. Um, the housing, so, <clears throat> it's online. Yeah, I'm looking at Links Crossing, a regular two twos, which is a double. So two people per room, two rooms, common area, uh, 5,200 per person for the semester. 5,200 for the semester. Okay. And again, we're not talking affordable housing here. Um, we're, we, we feel confident that 515 is, a, is a about the right number. When we opened this, we thought we wouldn't be able to fill 25 beds. We filled 55 in the first year. Last year, we went up to 120 some, 140 some. And this year we're at 370. So I think there are a population of students that want on-campus housing. Um, and if we start operating housing, I wanna sort of, the, so for me, the primary driver is we gotta get in the housing game if we ever want affordable housing. The second is we get 515 MSU Denver students living on campus. That means we've gotta provide evening programming for them. I think it will have a positive impact on what you experience as commuter students on campus. More programming, better food, and we'll get to that. Um, more services, more just vibrancy on campus in the evening um, for campus. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions. Time back to the last conversation a little bit. Um, will RTD like also kind of revolve around this plan a little bit? Tell me more. Commuter aspect. If these students need to leave anywhere, has that been factored in to in that terms of plan? like transportation wise? Oh, more lines and more options. Okay. So we, I think there's an ongoing conversation with RTD always about the service to campus. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a couple of you are interested in a shuttle service between Union Station and, and campus. Um, and I think AHEC has been talking about more of a like intermodal like a, a spot where like a common bus stop mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but in terms of housing, for now, assume no improvements to RTD. Okay. And then my second question was, is I forget the gentleman's name that was working on that, um, working with uh, Mejia. 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 Yeah, James. James, is he? He's leading it. He's doing there, awesome, okay. okay. We get to go to lots of fun meetings. He called me yeah. twice on the way over here. Oh, nice. She's okay, good. Still good. Yeah. So let me. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. so a quick question though. So who will run this yeah. housing? Is it going to be MSU run RA style or is it going to be an outside contractor? TBD, but we're leaning toward the, at least the residential life component being MSU Denver run. Oh, yeah. So you know, we would hire the staff to run it. We would have RAs who are students, you know, living in the building. Yeah. Because most students hate living in collabs. It's yeah. shitty thing all that stuff uh, around the block okay. so i mean if students i think i would say students would rather be msu at least mm -hmm. yeah. because yeah and again and it would go on the count and so uh yeah victor um it's a great idea um i think housing would be good but i think i'm more effective on how that's going to affect the commuters in the long run like yeah there's going to be housing and then more people are going to come in more people are going to pay more money but how is that going to affect the students that are coming in and commuting obviously you're going to want to build more housing to make more money i mean that's kind of obvious so the more you're going to want to build housing the less there's going to be an incentive for students to want to come to denver to to a metro mm -hmm. solely for that reason because it is easier, easier for most people to come to to school and then go back and do their regular lives. i think that's the whole point of metro so I feel like that's kind of, if we go into that direction, I think commuter students are going to be affected. 
a lot more than just. just yeah, I see what you're saying. I'll say two things. One is we know from just watching our enrollment trends year over year that our students are moving further and further away from Denver. And, and I don't think that's like we're attracting, we're not trying to do recruitment right in Longmont. We get a lot of students from Longmont. It's that Longmont is where you can afford to live now. <clears throat> the families are actually moving out of Denver and, and toward Brighton and Adams County. So we will never, so that's number one, like we, we, we cannot forget our commuter students. And at 17,000 students, 17,500 maybe this fall, depending on where we land, um, it's going to be a very long time until the campus might even be 40% residential and 60% commuter. So we can't lose that commuter mission. But the benefit, I think, back to the campus life is, let me throw the dining on the table, because this is where I think you'll start to see it. So if we build, if MSU Denver builds 550 beds of housing, that means I have to add very specific services. I have to add more counselors because we know that we'll need more psychologists. Um, we'll probably also have to add more student conduct uh, people because stuff happens at night, right? Mm -hmm. But it also means there's, there's more programming. There's more spaces. There's more emphasis on student organizations to do things. We, we will likely see campus start um, coming alive now. If you're over here after 5 o'clock, it's like a ghost town. <laughs> that's what I want to start changing, right? It's, but to do that, there's also got to be safety, lighting, um, food. And so part of the pro forma that we're looking at is increasing the number of public safety officers through ACPD to make sure that we've got more security. I think the point about RTD and safety at the stations is something we can talk about. Um, we would also have to put some sort of food in that building. People got to eat, right? So here's the opportunity. It's on a table, and I'll do one sentence and then throw it back to that. Um, CU Denver uh, has a contract with a food service provider, so they've got Einstein's Qdoba and their own dining hall. Um, everything else on campus are separate contracts with either AHEC or MSU Denver, so every vendor is a separate vendor, right? Starbucks, Dasbog, Sono, 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 because it's like Sono. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I lived in New York, there was Yum Yum Tai 1, Yum Yum Tai 2, and Yum Yum Tai 3. And they were all on two blocks. And they were all owned by the same people just because they, they needed more spots. It really is. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we've got an opportunity by adding another sort of food service on the campus to potentially outsource all the food to one like company that runs food. And remember, that's what CU Denver is doing now, and they're still getting the national brands, and they've got that all-you-can-eat dining hall. To do that, obviously the residents are going to have a, like a required meal plan, unless we just put kitchens in every room and don't. But um, it's an opportunity then for food to be better, more diverse, potentially more affordable, and we can start offering meal plans. And I'll offer two Sort of ways we could do that. One is here's a meal plan. If you want it, take it. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it, right? Um, and you can put a hundred bucks on your on your ID card a year, and you've got that hundred bucks to use on campus, and it goes through your student account. So financial aid will cover it, or mom and dad will pay the bill, or you'll pay the bill. Um, the other option, which is if we really want to make sure that we've got affordability built in, so the better terms we can offer. The, the food service provider, the company, the, the better pricing is. One of the ways to do that is for every student, not just residential students, to have a required meal plan. And I'm not talking a $5,000 a year meal plan. I'm talking about a model like five or $10 per credit hour that you take on, on campus, going on to your meal plan. We don't take a cut of it. So if you're taking six credits on campus and six credits online, and we're doing the $10 a model, you pay 60 bucks per semester. That $60 would go onto your ID card, hold, and you'd have $60 to spend at any of the food service folks on campus, right? But every student who takes an, an in-person class would have to do that. The way that works is that's guaranteed revenue to the food service provider. And so then they know it's like a sure thing for them. So they're more willing to, to help us get a better contract to help you circle. Did I describe that? I think you nailed it. Okay. Yeah. 
I see questions and I see some excitement, which is nice. Yeah. So I think eventually everyone who comes here eventually eats here, whether it be like picking up a coffee or whatever, you know. Um, and I do like that it's throughout the whole semester, meaning it's not like a monthly thing. They have that money to spend throughout that whole time, which gives them that flexibility to spend that money. Um, I think that's a good idea, but. Was that a secondary option? So it would be like the $60 worth of credit would go into the student account. So then would there be an option for people that are here more often that want more from the meal plan to like always add. It, like yeah. add more to it? Okay. I used to call my mom every three weeks and be like, hey mom, I need another hundred bucks on my dining plan because I ate it all at Pizza Hut. <laughs> I did. I ate Pizza Hut every day. I like the idea. Um, I do think like one thing we're hearing is healthier food on campus. Yeah. Because about nativity, you only find kind of grease and, 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 and yeah. it's kind of not really healthy. I don't think it matches the food that Colorado and students currently health conscious people kind of want. Mm -hmm. When Subway is your best option, it's kind of a real. And, and when you're negotiating, sorry, you talk about Yeah, that. no, I appreciate that, Will. And that, and that thing is spot on, right? So the benefit, sorry, you're good. Um, I mean, the benefit that we have if we outsource this to a single entity that does this across the country with college campuses is they have, and there's only like two or three people that actually play in this space, right? But they have 350 plus contracts with name brands across the country. They can get better terms. What does that mean for all of you? It means better pricing, right? So right now we have, you know, an independent in admin, we have an independent confluence, we have something in Cherry Creek, we have, you know, the Tivoli with the options in the basement, like you're talking about, Mike, right? Like the idea is let's have this single entity do heat mapping across the campus, which means where are people going? What are they like? What are they not like? What's important? Is it fresh? Is it affordable? Is it variety? Let's not have two of the same vendors right next to each other or three like you in Tivoli, right? Um, they can run this and uh, do it in a way where they're listening to the student voice, but also getting you know more affordable options, fresh options, and it's easier on us on the back end because we're working with one entity to go do this across the board as opposed to 17 one-off contracts, right? So when you're managing 17 contracts like AHEC is, it means we have cost to go manage those contracts, which means the price is going to be higher, right? So there's efficiencies on both sides if we get on this path. And I'll throw two other things out there that this does. One, in most of these contracts, we negotiate or at other schools, they, I've seen them negotiate a certain number of like vouchers that the provider gives to the institution per semester. For, for if a student goes to the care center and says, I haven't eaten in three days, okay. go to the dining hall right now, right? So there is a food insecurity um, direct benefit, but also I think for students who the required meal plan, it's on your student account and your Pell Grant will, will cover it depending on your hours, right? then we, we know they've got that service. The other is catering. And so this, typically if a vendor is gonna come in and do this for campus, they're gonna to wanna to also have a catering opportunity. And so the opportunity, like you run a lot of programs, you just call a catering office and you order the food and it shows up and you don't have to like call a restaurant downtown uh, all the time to do it. It just makes doing event planning on campus a lot easier and probably makes catering a little, little cheaper. And many of these food service providers still do maintain contracts with local restaurants and providers so that we don't lose that benefit to the community. Um, so one of them was telling us that they have a whole sort of women and minority owned hospitality business function where they bring in sub vendors. Um, to essentially run that on campus. My question, is that catering separate from the, that meal plan or is that separate. price wise? Separate. Separate. Okay. So it's more for the event planner. Yeah. Okay. You, know, you you still get free food at events. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to tap your meal plan. One more point too, because I know the question was asked, like, what about commuters? Because if we have permanent density, is it negatively impacting the people that are coming to campus? As we look at trying to get name brand, trying to get retail, trying to get convenience stores, trying to get you know, brands that resonate with students, those entities or those brands want to see demand. And the more permanent density, i.e. people living here all the time, it means there's more volume. It means we're going to be able to attract bigger brands to come to our campus that everyone can benefit from. So yeah. it's something to think through as well. How many of you have ever sat in your car in between classes, studied, ate, watched Netflix, anything? 
Yeah. I work here. I have. I have. Yeah. Or you struggle to find a place on campus to just sit and have a quiet minute between classes, right? That happens all the time. I see people sleeping in their cars when I go out in the middle of the day. We also get with better vendors, better seating, more opportunities like for, for just hangout space. And I think that's something I've noticed on this campus too. I got the, the hook. So Victor, you might get the last word. Um, well, I was going to kind of put myself in the vendor shoes that we have put in, in we have here. A lot of the vendors, like this is their biggest contract that they have on campus. So how would that affect the vendors? Are we thinking about them? Because a lot of them, this is like their day job, you know? Yeah. So if you take away their store at the science building or at you know, the admin, that's going to affect how they live. So are we thinking about them as well? Um, and also, uh, Oh man, I forgot. Let me write this stuff down. Uh, I'll, I'll think about it later. Yeah. Sure, I think it's it's a great question. It's one we've thought about quite a bit, right? I mean, I think if we look at our current vendors, a lot of them are kind of crop type vendors. So this is the primary role they play. I think it comes down to are what they serving what the students, faculty, and staff at this campus want, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's important that we retain some percentage of small business or BIPOC vendor or MWP, mm -hmm. uh, women owned minority owned business, then we write that into the scope of the contract with the vendor and they have to honor them, right? So we really need the voice of the students to tell us and faculty and staff, mm -hmm. how important is that in the overall criteria so that we can factor that into the scope. For that, are you guys going to be doing like surveying and focus groups for this part of the? Okay. With yeah. you, hopefully. With us, hopefully, I would yeah. love to be involved. And Alyssa and Alemo, you may or may not know her on our team on the AXI, but she works with SACAB and they've done some element of surveying and they're going to continue to do that this fall. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So before I go, is there any part of what you heard today that you are adamantly opposed to? No. <clears throat> no. I was just going to end on, I love this. And I'm very excited for it. So thank you for sharing this with us. Awesome. I, I, and I will end by saying, I think we're on the precipice of doing some really important transformational work on campus. It costs money. Um, we want to be transparent about what costs go back to students uh, and how we're doing those levers. So this is just the first conversation. We're not anywhere near making decisions about anything. Um, keep talking and make sure that everybody knows no decisions have been made okay. um, and keep filtering feedback to us. And I, I just want to, you know, while we're while he's here, you know, Zach has been a really amazing partner in this process. And I think Auraria, AHEC and MSU Denver share a really distinct vision for campus that Thank you. I was going to say, Dr. Simpkins, I know you did mention Tivoli. If you want to add, I can give you two to three more minutes and then probably one or two comments just so you're sure. not leaving yeah. anything off. The yeah, I can do it a minute and a half. How's that, right? So, Tivoli is the student union on the campus itself. Um, there's been a student fee that's been in place since 1991 on that building. And so, right now, every student on this campus pays roughly $88 per semester in fees that go to service the debts and the operation and maintenance of the Tivoli. Uh, the referendum that was passed in 91 and has since been kind of re-upped ever since has been used to pay for essentially revenue bonds or debt that we take out to improve that building. Right now, the work that was done 20 years ago, uh, the equipment that was installed is end of life. So we need to now go back out and we need to go refinish grease traps and HVAC and, um, you know, elevators and switch gear and things that people could probably care less about but are critical to make sure that that building works and so uh, it's our intent to keep that kind of fee in place as we go forward so that we continue to have the dollars that we need to put back into that building so we're going to work with you over this fall not only on that but also on kind of what we're calling Tivoli Reimagine, which is bringing together MSU and CU Denver and CCD with AHEC to say, what is it that we want the student union to be? It could be the most amazing student union in the country, quite honestly, right? Um, and so we're going to go through a committee process that students will be a part of that say, what do you want to see in this building? What needs to be improved? What works? What doesn't? Um, we're going to go lobby at the state level for construction dollars. We're going to use some of the fees, obviously, that you pay to take out that to go improve that building as well. It's going to be a big project. It's going to be something that runs pretty much from right now through 2030 before we see all of this come to fruition. 
uh, but we want all of you to play obviously an important role in the process. I have a quick question. Does every student um, across all the institutions pay the same fee? Yes? Okay. Do online students pay? So um, we'll talk about that. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the referendum says all students. Okay. Yes. Yep. Cool. One last comment? No. Have you ever um, thought um, for the AI, have you ever thought of changing the currency for um, parking, like, like, say like jelly beans? No. <laughs> no. 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 Stop. Jelly beans. We did a thing at our leadership That just came from the door. I just came and I love jelly beans, but I can't eat that many jelly beans. <laughs> <laughs> I think it has to stay. We did an imagine scenario where you have jelly beans. We were asking the other questions. I wanted to know if he was going to have the same thing. Thank you. Good luck this year. Congratulations again. Touch. Guys, <laughs> nice, okay. nice. y'all. Hey, hey, let's wrap it in. We did a short meeting, so we got business to do. So next is hot. We're crammed in. So, y'all, let's please keep it down so we can keep it moving. We did shorten the meeting. So, next thing on the agenda is the voting of co chairs. Um, for everyone. Co-chairs. For everyone who was nominated co-chairs, I will do one round of the final acceptance of nominations, and then I'll determine who's doing our speech. <coughs> so persons nominated for co-chairs, Haley, do you still continue to accept the nomination with your speech today? Continue to accept. Perfect. Thank you. Levi? Yes. Okay. Alejandro? Yes. Uh, Amelia? No. Okay. Victor? No. All right, so we have Haley, Levi, and Alejandro giving their speeches today. Uh, remember, we said five up to five minutes for culture speeches, and then we will do um, some deliberation after. Like I said, we want to keep things moving today. So first up, I will just go with Levi. Nick. Yeah, he, he can do a timer. Um, you can. I should stay here. Yeah, you can stay here because the camera's right there. Uh, Alejandro and Haley, if you could just step out for us, please. Or actually, wait, did we keep them in? We almost had them step out last year. Yeah, that's okay. Hey. Hi. Hi. We'll come get you when we're switching. All right. The floor is yours. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Levi Chi, and uh, I'm excited to be part of TSAC and get to know more about each and every one of you as we work together in the coming weeks. We already have some experiences together, but I still feel like uh, to truly know each other, we still got to get more involved. Um, I'm here speaking in front of all of you for the role of co-chair of the committee, which is a large task. It's not only assisting with meetings, but helping the chair with their responsibilities while managing meetings. The vice chair is going to be the support for the chair. They can help uh, make the council run smoothly or crack and drag it down. It is a little, sorry. It is a, sorry, I remember better. Right. It is a title that holds a lot of responsibility besides the duties to the meetings. They also have the additional responsibility to go into critical committees that the chair also has to attend to stay on track with the various uh, leaders that run or arrive. Uh, while I may be new to TSAC and I bring with me, I still bring with me a wealth of uh, leadership experience. I've served as a director of public relations at Pueblo Community College and associate student government where I successfully led a variety of projects. These include organizing public events like Core on the Hoag, advocating for bills in Congress during business trips, and spearheading a specific project for our campus. Additionally, the image of TSAC among our older peers and leadership on campus is damaged as the previous council members have had an issue of the previous semester over their heads. And whether or not their thoughts are justified for the board of trustees and other leadership of Mongorari, it still remains that other groups we share governance with have a negative view of the council. Where we have some talk about fixing our image, and the first step towards that is having someone now take the someone new take the reins of leadership. 
We want to better ourselves and not let the issues of the previous council come again for this election season in November. The new member of TSAC needs to be the co-chair. I understand that this is why I should be the co-chair of TSAC and I understand the responsibilities and experience in this type of position. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we will open up the floor to the rest of the council for any questions. I will say for time's sake, if we could try to keep it to three at most four. And please try to keep your questions consistent across participants. Sorry. Mike. So Amelia, then Mike. Mike. Uh, oh. <laughs> he called me. You called oh, me. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us. I'm very excited for you. Uh, one question that I will be asking everybody who is running for any chair is, what is your capacity? This isn't something you have to say out loud, but it's something that I want people to think about. It's like, when you think about your time and your commitments, and when you think about committing, do you have the capacity for it realistically? If you do, if you don't, it's just something that I want everybody to be thinking about. Um, and I'll end with that for time's sake. Um, you don't so, have to answer if you don't want to. If you would like to, please. But So my capacity is that uh, I made it. So for the kind of way I structured this semester for uh, time flipping classes and then doing this is that um, because of some other stuff, I'll have, I'm not working a job this semester, but I'll be able to, you know, pay for everything and be fine. So I have a lot more time in that sense. So school is mainly my main priority this semester. Mm -hmm. okay. Beautiful. Michael? So, yes, yeah, so my question is about organization. Um, just to give you some context, I probably get about 100 emails a week from different people over the school. Um, and Danny, last or last co chair, or chair did as well. Um, how do you, how will you organize that? What resources will you use to keep yourself organized? That's probably a discussion I'm going to need to make with my chair because I will admit that I am new to this role. Um, but I'm not afraid to take up the responsibility and try my best and to take it. It seems like a great undertaking, which is why I see it as an important responsibility. But I'll try to like be knowledgeable and prove what I can. I got one question. Thank you, Levi. Um, how do you plan as co-chair since you're running the meetings? At least try to be unbiased. I feel like an uh, important part of being a team is getting to know everybody and um, spending time with people. Uh, I think the best way to be unbiased is to give a fair assessment to everybody by getting to know them, being more involved with them, and understanding their uh, aspects about them. You know, I kind of like had this idea of whether or not I'd be co-chair or on committee, at the very least taking dedicated time to spend time with each member of the uh, council to try to get to know them better, understand, you know, their motivations, what they plan on doing for the semester, and what they Imagine for TSAC. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to ask a question. Uh, so, Levi, as a co chair for TSAC, there, there, are, there can be opportunities where uh, conflict can occur within a meeting, where the tensions can run high, emotions run high. How, how might you? Um, manage those types of situations, or do you, what tools or skills or resources might you draw upon to think about how you might uh, approach that type of? Because it's inevitable, as we talked about this summer, and so just curious um, what experience you might have, or skill set, or how you might access those in this role. So previous experience I have is that um, besides military and like I worked um, with the veterans office for the past couple of years, both here and other places, and trying and solving disputes. Uh, like I said, dedicate time before uh, it's been time, but also trying to make sure we move forward together when it comes to the missions or problems we have currently in the meeting, and then try to address those concerns outside of it so we can mitigate the circumstances. So thank you for that. Closes our time <clears throat> for comment questions for Levi. Levi, thank you so much. If you could send in Alejandro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just stop asking and I'm going to assume.
That's all. Mm -hmm. She gave me all my stuff. So mm -hmm. throughout my twenty years, she always gave me stuff. No, I wasn't listening. Getting new ones. Oh, wait, look, look. Oh, really? oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Now we have Alejandro Casillas present. Um, you will have up to up to five minutes <laughs> and then, uh, for about three to four questions, depending on the time. All right. So we'll go ahead and start the timer. Floor is yours. So the reason why I think I would be a good uh, person for this position would be because I do have quite a bit of experience with TSAC when it comes to um, last year's council. So I do, I am quite familiar with um, how things run and, you know, know when to cut things off, when to know, when to continue the conversations and just basically make sure that everybody stays on track to ensure that, you know, we don't lose any type, any time and we get through everything throughout the agenda. Um, of course, this is a new council, so it's going to take a little bit of time to get used to, like, I wouldn't necessarily say pushing people's limits, but knowing when to shut them down and say, hey, um, right now is not the time. Let's continue with what we're here to do and, you know, doing it in a professional manner, I guess you can say. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's all I really have. I have the experience in it, so I feel like I can help out. And then uh, especially with the new council, I feel like it would be good because it would Basically, I would be almost like a guide for the students to, or not the students, the, the new council members to know what they have to do and how to basically run the meetings. Awesome. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, questions? Oh, are we going to do the same order? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, one question that I have is you can either answer out loud or just think and reflect on it, um, but in terms of capacity. Um, you know, opportunities like being chair, being co-chair are really, really exciting. And I think, I mean, you've obviously been on the council before, so I think you understand more of the the capacity and what that takes. But I just ask you to like reflect on that uh, in terms of like what is on your plate, work, student government, classes. Is this something that you have the space for? Um, and again, you can either answer or you can re just reflect and think about it. Yeah, yeah, um, well, certainly. Yeah, I definitely do think that I do have the capacity for it. Um, you know, I have been quite involved on campus for a while, but um, this year I kind of decided to take a step back from our organization and let them do their own thing while I kind of help them from the background rather than being up front and helping them as much as I can. Mm -hmm. I can. So I basically, I guess you could say, I have opened up more space to um, focus more on TSAC. Okay. You're talking about your organization skills. It's a very organized position. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, going back to when I first joined my fraternity, uh, they definitely taught me how to stay organized. Um, they taught me quite a bit about time management, so it basically has helped me know what to prioritize, when to prioritize it. Um, when it comes to TSAC, I know specifically keep it to TSAC. I shouldn't necessarily focus on, oh, I have a assignment due tomorrow, so let me do it in the middle of the TSAC meeting, something like that. Um, when it comes to like specific, I don't know, uh, topics or something, I, I basically like to have everything laid out for what I want to talk about. So if I know that there's something specific that I want to talk about in TSAC, I make sure that I have everything set up. And I wouldn't necessarily say in the order that I want to talk about it, but Make sure that I have like the main details there, so I know. Okay, I need to speak about this. I need to speak about this and this. So I, I basically, I guess you could say, I set up a plan so I try to stay as organized as I can for everything. Um, hey, Ali. So, you know, being a chair is very important, and you're running the meetings. How do you plan to keep yourself uh, in check with your own biases? Yeah. Um, so. Again, I mean, I try not to be as biased as I can because, of course, I I myself don't like it when other people are being biased about anything. So I try to stay away from that. I, you know, whenever there's something that I don't like, like, let's say, again, if I see somebody being biased about a certain topic, I myself try to make sure that I'm not biased about anything because if I dislike it, I'm pretty sure other people are going to dislike it. Um, uh, if there's ever a time where I get out of control, you know, or I wouldn't say out of control, but like I go off topic, I try to, I guess, grab myself from the collar and be like, hey, <laughs> pull myself back, <laughs> hey, calm down now. You know? But yeah, I, I, I try to stay away from being biased. I do 
basically whatever we're here for is what I try to stay focused on regardless of what it is. So even if it's something that I'm not too fond about, I just try to make sure to focus on it till we get past through it. Thank you. So uh, you touched on this a little bit during um, your, your time. As you know, conflict is inevitable and sometimes um, emotions can come into the, the student government meetings and um, as a co-chair it's your role and your responsibility to facilitate the meetings to be productive spaces and where people feel heard but also you know being able to manage difficult conversations um, so what skill set do you bring to that, do you bring to that or and or what resources or things would you pull in to be able to navigate some of those things yeah so um you know obviously being in the organization that i've been that i've ended up with uh, new off kappa um obviously we're not all going to be agreeing on the same thing so we do tend to you know bump heads a lot um i always come from a side where i need to hear their point of view before i try to say oh no my point of view is right um and i'm like a firm believer that conflict isn't necessarily a bad thing it's always it's good to have conflict and like disagree with one another because it helps each other not only grow but also see a <coughs> different perspective and just make sure that everything is being heard but also doing it in like a professional way and not just being not just listening and letting them talk and be like okay well Yuri spoke but you know not listening and um but emotions I I feel like I do tend to I'm able to control my emotions very well um so whenever I'm in a conflict you know I I stay very calm I let them speak their mind and then, you know, I give them the respect that I think I should get as well while I'm speaking. So I basically try to be, I try to look at them at a, eye to eye, I guess you can say, so. Thank you. Awesome, well that's all. Thank you so much Alejandro. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. We can definitely do chair for all of us. Can I stand back here? Wherever you want. Cool. Oh, yeah. Cool. And then, should I introduce myself for the sake of people watching at home? Sure. Watching the recordings? Okay. Where's yours? Perfect. So, hi, everyone. For those of you who don't already know, my name is Haley Glass. I am a senior at MSU this year, majoring in political science and minoring in legal studies. And this is my very first year serving on TSAC. I was honored to be nominated for the chair position and thought long and hard about whether to accept it. As many of you know, this is a valuable semester for me as I prepare for the LSAT and apply for law school. After multiple discussions with my fellow council members and advisors, I've decided to accept the nomination and I believe it is something that I can manage on top of my other priorities. However, I also wanted to raise some of my own personal ideas surrounding this position that I thought may be important in your consideration. The Student Advisory Council is built to have a flat structure in which no person should have more power or responsibility. In actuality, it doesn't always seem to work out that way. In regards to the chair position, the text within our own constitution claims that this leadership role is intended to primarily maintain parliamentary order and represent the council and MSU Denver's president's cabinet. Aside from that, chairs will share an equal and fair distribution of power given to all other members. In accepting my nomination as chair, I intend to uphold the Constitution and maintain an equal and fair distribution of power within the Council. I am more than willing and able to maintain parliamentary order, represent the Council and the President's Council, and handle any direct requests of the Council that are brought to my attention. I am also more than happy to address any concerns or issues brought to my attention that are within my personal scope. These are all responsibilities well within my capacity. I just want to ensure that as we enter this start of this year, you all understand that if you choose to elect me as chair, that a vote for me is a vote for a fair distribution of power, responsibility, and effort on this council. And that it, this is something I will be holding you all accountable to. Mm, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've established my ability to not this. No, I'm not done. <laughs> I've established my ability to handle this position um, in my current capacity and address how I envision the role functioning. I thought it was also important for me to address my background in leadership and how it can enable me to excel within this specific role. Although this is only my first year on the council, I have an extensive leadership background holding a variety of executive roles over the years in the many clubs, sports, and organizations I have participated in, the most relevant of these roles being my involvement in student government. 
I was involved in student council starting from the time I was just a baby little second grader and every year following all the way through my senior year of high school, giving me roughly 10 years of experience. Each year I was on the council, I also held a president or vice president role as elected by the student body. Holding these positions required me to advocate for the student body in a variety of manners and helped me to navigate and build upon my own leadership abilities. The most prominent of these roles was when I was elected student body president my senior year. I was holding this role from 2020 to 2021, meaning I was helping to navigate issues surrounding COVID, the return to normalcy, political issues, <coughs> and much more when holding this position. This time period promoted a lot of growth in me as leader. It taught me how to handle the constant feedback from peers, both positive and negative, and it, how to approach interpersonal conflict among students in a productive manner. While my time in student government was meaningful to my leadership experience, I wanted a change after my senior year and decided to explore my leadership in a different capacity. My first year here at Metro, I joined the Urban Leadership Program, and through that, I managed to learn how to be a leader in a different manner and shifted my perspective on what it truly means to be a leader. This group allowed me to explore my leadership in a more community-based manner, completing volunteer work, meeting individuals in different career paths, attending workshops, and learning what it meant to be a leader in your everyday life without a title to fall back on. My experience working with this group has allowed me to learn and grow, and the concepts that I have learned, I believe would be highly relevant to holding this position. There is a strong possibility that this semester may be one of turmoil for a variety of reasons, but I'm committed to promoting positive growth and change while representing the student body and their perspectives on an abundance of issues. I can ensure each and every one of you that if elected, I will be fully committed to this role and I will serve the council and the student body to the best of my abilities. I think the team that we have here is spectacular in a variety of ways. Um, and I think Y'all are spectacular anyways, and I would be more than happy to become your chair with the support and commitment of all of you behind me. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, I'm going to ask my question because I we have to continue. Um, in terms of your, you can either answer out loud or just reflect on it, but something that I've been asking people is in terms of capacities. Mm -hmm a large role to take on, potentially even larger than I am privy to, um, which I think is an important consideration when you're stepping into any leadership space. Um, so do you feel as if you have the capacity for this position? You can either answer or you can just reflect on it. Absolutely, I will answer it. I mean, I kind of addressed it in my speech as well, and I addressed it with quite a few of you in individual conversations as well. This was something I thought long and hard about, and I had to do my own research on the chair role what it has meant in the past, what it's supposed to mean, and kind of how I would want to approach it, and if it would be something that I would be capable of with my other priorities. Right. And after having multiple conversations, I think my most helpful one was my conversation that I had with Tony and CMEI, um, just because she knows me and my leadership background really well from leading the ULP. And I decided that it is something that I think is within my capacity. Yeah. But um, my question, you basically answered my question in your speech beautifully. Organization, um, there's a lot of organization required for the role. Um, do you want to just speak on a little bit of your organizational skills? Yeah. Um, do you mean like in terms of keeping yourself organized? Keeping myself <clears throat> organized. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm somebody who's had to manage a lot of priorities my entire life, my entire career of college. I have worked full time served on multiple clubs and organizations and attended school full time. Um, so that is something that requires a lot of balance, um, a lot of hard work, and you have to know what things matter and what to give your time and energy to um, and when you need to delegate or take a step back. Um, so that is something that I've had a lot of experience with in my past when I held student government roles previously, but also just like in my own personal life, trying to make sure that I am taking care of myself and my mental health first. Um, but ensuring that the goals of my teams are always met, whether that means I need to take a step back and have somebody step forward, or if that means it's something that I need to tackle on my own or otherwise. But did that address your question? Or? Perfectly. Thank okay. you. Awesome. Thank you, Haley. Um, what will you do to keep your biases in check? In terms of anything specific or just kind of in general? When running the meetings. Okay. Um, obviously, I'm new to the council, so I don't know any of you guys too well, so I'm kind of coming into this 
without anybody knowing anybody's views and perspectives mm -hmm. um in holding the leadership positions that i've had to hold in the past specifically that student body position when i was holding that during an election year as well um obviously people are going to have different viewpoints um even within my own personal life my family my friend groups all groups and stuff that i've led people are going to have different viewpoints the way that i manage it is just making sure we hear everybody out everybody has a reason behind their perspectives everybody has is entitled to their own opinions mm -hmm. um and although i may disagree they still have the right to share and if i'm like leading the group and in charge of that i'm not going to directly call them out and be like hey you're wrong i actually disagree with that unless it's in a meaningful productive manner where it's like hey have you considered this option within your idea um so just taking a more mature kind of rounded approach to it does that answer your question it does thank okay. you Awesome. That is all of our time for okay. questions for this round. Um, so if you can step out, we will take the next five minutes to deliberate with the council, and then I'll call back. Call the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's not. And we will open up the floor for deliberation for five minutes. We don't, we don't have to take all that time, but this is just free for all. So. Yeah. Or say amongst yourselves. I'll throw this out there. Um, in the three years I've been on student government, I think Haley had the most put together, confident student government speech I have ever heard. Oh the organization capacity, everything. I mean, the confidence. That's what that role needs. And I think, quite honestly, a pairing with someone who's a little more experienced, like Alex, Alejandro, <laughs> solid pairing. But that's just my humble opinion. Um, I'm I do agree with you, but my consideration, I didn't answer the question, but she may know how to handle everything and manage a lot of stuff, but like, I didn't hear anything of once we have a bunch of conflict in the committee or in the council, how will she able to de-escalate the situation? Where was her experience on that? Like, hey, maybe we need to stay, step back and stuff like that. Oh, she didn't get a chance because remember, um, the Iran was supposed to ask that question and I didn't know. The time? Yeah, the time, because I was listening for them also. The, the, but the, I'm pretty sure she's going to do it. Oh, yeah. That's I, a great point. I, I, like, mm -hmm. I feel like out of like, obviously all of us mental health is important, but like this community is like huge and like mm -hmm. we are going into like not knowing anything. I'm going into not knowing anything and like obviously when I have a situation, I'm like, who am I going to like go to? I'm like, hey, this is what I'm having. This is the situation that's going on. I need your support, or like, how are you going to like balance both without biasing it? Mm -hmm. in, in terms of representation for TSAC, them going into these meetings, it would be beneficial, I think, to have Haley there because she's very, she prepares, she thinks about the meeting, she thought about it for a really long time. She talked to me about it. But also, like you guys, like she was saying, like, I don't, I don't see her ability to cut off a conversation or like assert herself in that way. I don't know if you guys remember back to when we were having our uh, our retreat. She kind of like, like kind of tried to stay quiet when when they made her do the activity and stuff. Um, so I don't know if that might be indicative of how she's going to uh, do the meetings. Um, and in terms of Levi and Alejandro. Um, Hmm. Let me think about that. Um, really quick on that point. Uh, good point, Victor. I do think if Alejandro is elected in, he will bring in his experience. And from me and Mike's and Matthew's experience, he knows how to cut, cut people off. If Haley isn't able or as experienced with that portion of conflict, you know, controlling the meetings, I do believe Alejandro would be able to help with that. And you touched on a very essential point here is representation. And I think it's very vital because of this semester and what's going on, right? Election year, the protests, everything, right? So that's just something else to consider. Something that I would like to bring up is um, I, I, mean, I know Haley would be an amazing co-chair. And I think we all saw that for ourselves as well, and even before her time today, coming and speaking with us, asking, you know, what we think, um, and also talking to Miss Tony, who knows her really well. So I think 
you know, the way that she was even approaching this step of the process of being co-chair, I really, really, really thoughtful, really, really thorough. I think the thing that is top of mind for me is capacity. Yes, she can clearly handle a lot. Um, and I don't want to like insert myself and be like, well, I don't want you to have to like be completely, completely at capacity. Um, and something that is um, holding, like something that I'm still thinking about is Levi is doing school and that's it. And so I think, well, yes, you know, I think they have different leadership capabilities. Um, I think there is something to be said about capacity. I really, really think there is because for myself, I have been in a position where I completely overbooked myself and I learned the hard way that, yes, well, I might think I can do something and really, really want to do it realistically. How does my week play out? How much time am I spending on homework? Am I adequately spending that time on homework? She's studying for the LSAT. The LSAT is a really big thing. It's like larger than the GRE. Like, and like, it's something really, really substantial that she's studying for right now. And so that's, I'm just considering capacity. Like I know that they would both be beautiful. Um, and I do, I am really want a previous council member to be there as well, to help, you know, guide the conversation um, with that experience as well. But that's just something that I'm thinking about just because of capacity reasons. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, I think in my year, my experience, at least the co chair structure that we've chosen to go with, there's always been kind of a main co chair and a secondary co chair. So the first year it was Dan and Paul, then it was Chad and Taylor, sort of thing. It's always been kind of that, that dynamic. We need to be a TARS, but that's just my opinion. My well, clarifying question, weren't you guys both chair? I was trustee. Uh, I've, I've never been co-chair. Okay. So who's the other co-chair? Matt, Matt was in the previous chair, then Alejandro was vice chair. So, yep. All right, everyone, um, at this time, if you could pull out your phones, computers, whatever you have in front of you, you will be voting for the two. Um, so they can vote. Yeah. I'm about to go on right away. Is this on teams? On teams. On teams. In the meeting, yes. Oh, or meeting. you're the student government council. Yes. Can you put that in the student government council? Uh, very exciting, y'all. Exciting. Why did I keep doing this? Sorry about that. I'll, I'll throw you in the student. <laughs> Everyone will have you. See, I. What are they gonna do without you? Oh my gosh. We're going to do that, man. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll tell them this morning before the earth knows. We're going to tell them my access before. I'm just here. I'm just a concerned student. That's all I can say. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, y'all. What are you doing? Hello. 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 even tie. Hold on. We'll figure it out. We'll get boxing gloves in the back alley. Hi. Let's go. Oh, she's ready. I'm ready. Who's your fighter? I actually do kickboxing as a hobby. It's funny you can borrow a switchblade. Just take it to the ground. He's basically telling you you can't. Talk him out. Okay. Then with the is in the TSAC chat, or our chat. Okay. Can you just tell us? Um, <coughs> while you all are doing that, I do want to make a note of time. We do only have 15 minutes left of the meeting, so oh. we've shortened it to an hour and a half. Um, so two things to consider. We won't vote on it today, but if we need to go back to our two hours, I don't see Dr. Simpkins a talks a lot, and he does that often. <laughs> he rambles, and it, we, we all struggle to get him back down. <laughs> it's a university issue at this point. Um, but two things that I do think probably will take precedence today um, are voting of public comment times. Mm -hmm. We do need to establish that for the public and more than for them to know what times they have to come in and comment. It's typically just 15 minutes throughout the meeting. What, Michael? It's 1.30, that's one. 
I, mean, I know that that wasn't fixed. Oh, uh, I remember when we had voted in the retreat, we said eleven thirty to one. Um, and then finalizing our goals and committee chairs. I still think we can move to the next meeting. I don't think it's that we don't we don't have any committees that have not been touched on or messaging has gone through the university that we're still working on some things and those who need to be talked to have already been talked to. So is everyone comfortable with moving those two things to the next meeting? Committee. So committee chairs and finalizing of goals. I do think the budget. Uh, that's a cool thing. Well, the budget, we actually, we did. We'll talk about that later. We'll probably bring that up next meeting. Um, uh, is everyone comfortable moving with those? Are there any oppositions? I have a quick question. Are Have any of these committees started meeting yet? Nobody has met anything except okay. for the ones by the university. Okay. And we, and we put people in those places okay. already. Okay. <laughs> CCAP meeting starts. CCAP is next Friday. Uh, they were supposed to contact. I have the invite. I think I forwarded it. All right. Any opposition to those two moving to the next? No? Okay. I know, but that's fine. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm still waiting on one more person to vote. I only see nine completions. Who's going to be voted? I did not vote. So I would like to motion on the floor to approve moving, moving items B and D, voting of committee chairs and finalizing the goals to next week. Um, anyone in opposition? One, two, anyone abstain? No, all right, movement passes. Thank you so much. Um, you just write that down. All right, so 10 completions now. Congratulations to our new co chairs, uh, Alejandro Casillas and Haley Glass. As we are nearing the ending of time, I'll just continue finishing this meeting and then we'll talk at some point throughout the next week to get you all caught up and Alejandro can talk to Haley about what it's like to run the meeting and everything from there. Cool. All right, moving on to voting of public comment times. Um, this is something that the public comment, any student, faculty, staff, community member has the ability to come into the TSEC meeting um, and just kind of share thoughts, opinions, grievances, comments, compliments, whatever they, they want to share. Um, does anyone from the previous council want to add anything on public comment? No? All right. Um, go ahead. Yes. Uh, how often did people come to public comment? It really depends. Depends, on, depends what's going on. <laughs> yeah. um, sometimes we vote. Sometimes we see nobody. Sometimes it's packed. Yeah. Um, just public comment times. It is 15 minutes throughout the meeting, and each speaker, group, series, whoever comes in, team, they have five minutes, up to five minutes. Um, so I will open the floor for discussion for you all to kind of bounce back and forth of when you think is best for public comment time. I see Alejandro. I would say 12:15. Towards the end of the meeting? Well, 15. Towards the middle. Wait, so 11 30 to 1. Oh, sorry. Yeah. In these new classes. Yeah. You know what else? I, mean, yeah. I would say the beginning, actually, um, because I think. <laughs> I think that allows us to, you know, come into the meeting, hear people speak, and then kind of move forward with business. our with our business. Yeah, um, I think if it was, you know, throughout the duration of our meeting, I would be worried that we would have to cut something off of our meeting to then bring in public comment and then transition back to it. And so I think this has happened before, just mm -hmm. so you know. Oh, okay. So to me, it feels more seamless to do it right in the beginning. Are we going to have to vote on anything at all when people come and talk, or is it just like they come and present so whatever the idea they have? Then... Those are two different things. So public comment is just commentary, okay. um, but they can propose to bring something to the agenda. That will we then vote on. Our process is we hear it, we sit on it for a week, we vote the next week, typically, on majority of things that we vote on. Uh, I do like putting the idea of putting that in the beginning just because 
if someone has something to say about maybe a solution or like a so, you know something positive or negative about business we're going to conduct that day i think the students deserve to be heard before we conduct that business can you see that again so i think it is better to put it in the beginning because when they voice their opinions on possibly business we're doing that day right but lean on it might influence us it might you know at least at the very minimum their voices were heard before any business was finally conducted. So. I have a tangential concern with that of working towards getting it to where students actually know what's going on in our meetings more than just like the agenda. Is if they're trying to comment on like new business and we like don't have the resolution up or anything where they can see it, how are they going to comment? Well, it doesn't have to necessarily be any bills, I would say, that we're presenting mm -hmm. that they haven't seen, but it could be an, you know, a, a tabled resolution, a tabled mm -hmm. talk, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, you know. So a reoccurring thing that you know they can come to that meeting and voice their opinions before maybe we do a vote or something. Mm -hmm. So. I have an edit to my time. Mm -hmm. um, I think even as I'm looking. At our agenda today, I think doing it, doing public comment after housekeeping mm -hmm. would be a better idea um, because then I think that might give people who are here for public comment um, essentially some further context um, on our meetings, how they flow, and what we are like. So you want to say 35, 40? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good time. And and just if no one shows up for public comment, we just keep moving. Yeah. But that time is slotted, so if someone does pop up, we will stop what we're doing. They can speak okay. for the five minutes, and then we go back. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Any further comments, discussion? No. What we'll do is I'll go around. Um, so the two times that are on the floor is 11.35 and 12.15. So right about uh, five minutes after housekeeping, and then right in the middle of the meeting. Um, I will go around and just one by one, if just say your preference of time, if you could keep track of who says what. All right, um, so I I put a motion on the floor to open up time, voting times for public comment. Do I have a second? Second. All right, thank you. So times are 11.35 and 12.15, Will? 11.35. Matthew? 12.15. Levi? 1235. 11 35. 11 35. 11 35. 11 35. 11 35. So what is that? So 11 35 passes with uh, six to four. One, two, three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. Yeah, majority. Yes, Matthew. I just want to throw out that is another thing, though. Uh, we need to make sure to be here on time then. Yes. yes. Thank okay. you for that. Thank you for that notice. Perfect. Um, cool. So times pass. It is 1135. I will make sure to add that um, and have Brandon add that to all the agenda so everyone knows. Um, we have about seven minutes left. We move those two items on new business. Uh, typically, if you look on your agenda here, this is typically the rundown of how we do our announcements. Um, so SACAB, Board of Trustees, Judiciary, budget, PR, sustainability, open floor, faculty, staff, senate, dean of council. I do remember it needs to be changed. Um, transitional leader. This is just an example from last semester. We just copied it for the second first meeting. Um, I will open floor. Are there any things that you all have been privy to? We'll just do open floor announcements today um, that we want to make on record. Yes, I do. I will try to be swift with this. Um, I spoke with Matthew, Will, and Victor yesterday. Um, some students from SDS have reached out to me. They reached out to me both week before school um, discussing a referendum for MSU Denver to stop taking money from Lockheed because we don't invest in them. So it's not a divestment. Um, and I I had a conversation with them and I wanted to know where they were at in terms of research. I wanted to know where they were at in terms of 
what are you hoping to get out of this? Um, I will also share for context, it was a meeting with somebody that I, it was a few members of SDS. One of them I have a relationship with in a personal capacity. And so it, it was a space that I was entering that was new to me, but it was also a space that I felt very grateful to be in at the same time. And I also wanna say, I know that uh, I was not in the council last year when you know everything was happening. Um, and I recognize that I am approaching this conversation in a different way than potentially some of the previous council members. And so I just want to put that out there. Um, and so I wanted to bring this up because the students asked me, you know, like, are any other council members interested in like talking with us? You know, what would this look like to get this passed? And so I can share further details. I'm trying to be quick about this because I'm looking at time. There's a lot more details to it. Um, and what I was telling, you know, folks yesterday was, you know, maybe you disagree about the way that SDS does things. Maybe you don't like the way things have shaken out. Maybe you don't agree with their demands, but I think we need to do something, whether that is a student town hall, whether that is a survey asking the students who occupy those buildings what it would mean for them to change funding. Because the whole thing that I care about is like, it's not taking away the money, it's changing who gives the money um and so i think we have to do something because for myself at least attempting to do something is better than not doing anything thank you any direct response i mean you already touched upon it um yeah. full support as long as from me um, as long as we get the voices of the students that are most affected by this. I would second that. I would, I would just say, um, yeah, like how you mentioned, as long as they come in with the plan, because if they just want us to not take more money, I mean, that's probably going to bring up tuition costs on everybody. Yeah. Um, if they don't want us to have anything to do with Bucky, then how MSU Denver find other sponsors, um, other opportunities for internships, because at the end of the day, not everybody's going to get an internship at Lockheed. Not everybody's going to have that intention that they think what Lockheed normally has or whatever. But like, yeah. at the end of the day, maybe somebody does end up working for Lockheed and they're doing it with the intention of bringing good change instead of, you know, causing more destruction with the missiles or whatever it is that they're doing and so on. But if they're just asking us to move away from Lockheed, they should come in with the plan rather than just be like, do this, do this, do this. This yeah. is what we want, but mm -hmm. yeah. we want to do more work. Yeah. To, I hear you. To second that, that we spoke earlier yesterday. Mm -hmm. We looked at the exact same piece you said. Like, if there's, that's a lot of money, that a lot of resources that students are going to not have anymore if that huge institution leaves. So with a plan, with other financial incentives or other funding needs, and there, if we once we set the goals, there's going to be some. We also came up with some different ideas, so um, about trying to find different avenues. Um, and that was all spoken yesterday. But if you guys want, we can like set up a meeting and talk about it. Can I just so, see a? Oh, I was just going to say, can I see a show of hands after you are done? Because I want this to be collaborative. I don't want to do this in a silo so if you are interested in any part of this process whether that's sitting in, in a meeting that i facilitate with students whether that is looking at the notes or debriefing with me afterwards everybody at this table has a part in this it's not just a me project it's a us project if you want to be a part of it so after 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 mike yes if you want me in roles i'm more happy to but i'll let you do it it's up to you though i'm not it's actually, uh, it's actually up to you. Well, I mean, I have a very clear bias here from last semester. So, so if you, you want, if you want, put your bias out of your work, Mike. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not <laughs> <through>. <laughs> 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 all out of love, and I understand, and that's why I preface the conversation with, I understand that I am coming into this conversation with a very different lived experience than some people like yourself. So we can chat. We can chat about it next week. Yep. Was your comment quick? Um, I can let go. Okay. Um, one thing I did wanted to mention, just like you said, like what Alejandro said, like them bringing a plan. But like, I think my concern is like, why are these students who are protesting are one getting all of the information and not everybody else? And that's the thing that 
And that's that's the thing I'm confused at because we know a certain part of information and they understand this part of information. We need to make sure that all of the students know everything what's happening with Rocky Mountain, mm -hmm. what is the effect of this. I'm like, and I feel like that is considered of like I don't know how to explain it. Like, mm -hmm. it's a strategy plan of mm -hmm. how we not advertise it, but how we provide exactly and how we provide that information to mm -hmm. the students. Yeah, I hear that. So it sounds like you want to do an informational town hall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Since yeah. on the floor, since it is one o'clock, do you, can I put a motion on the floor to extend it by ten minutes just to finish this conversation in a timely fashion? Um, second, thank you. Anyone in opposition? Oh, sorry. No. All right. Motion passes. Continue. Um, Matthew, come in. Yeah, I also wanted to bring up because to my knowledge SDS also isn't a recognized student org at this point. Yes, I, I was going to say that as a point of information from advisors and CMEI. Um, SDS is not a recognized student organization. They have not applied for recognition. Um, they're going through their own thing. So if this is SDS at MSU at Auraria, that is we cannot, not that we cannot, we can talk to them if they have the same views as SDS as students but we are not talking to SDS. Does that make sense? Can you maybe rephrase that? We can talk to the students, we can't talk to SDS. Yes, yes. Everybody that I spoke to in my meeting were students. And they need to be MSU students. And they were also MSU students. I right. checked about that too. That is the biggest thing that, yes, SDS is not a recognized organization, so. Um, was that it for you? Yeah. Was that what you were gonna say? Michael, let me re rephrase my statement. Um, so let me put my personal bias aside. The board has taken a position on this, and I am inclined to not go against the board at this time. So unless, like, I'm open to it. I'm open to kind of meeting the of that, but I will probably, at the end of the day, kind of work with the board and kind of inform them of it. But they have a very strong position on it, unless you, like, unless they come with some stuff and change that, that perspective. So. Mm -hmm. If it's a personal conversation next week. We, we still haven't had that conversation yet. Um, can you, if you have the capacity to um, elaborate on what that means in terms of the board? So the board may kind of, so unlike any other kind of school, the board actually chose our board to actually meet with SDS. Okay. And what they brought to us last semester was nothing like what you're describing. Mm -hmm. They just said divest from Mm -hmm. Or we're quit accepting donations like yeah. mm -hmm. Not really. And then our obvious follow up was what about the students who are using those funds? I mean, mm -hmm. the students who gain those jobs they didn't have an answer for us. Mm -hmm. They kind of put that ball on our court in a sense. Mm -hmm. And we said, no, mm -hmm. pushed it back. So I'm not saying like this, they're going to change, the board is going to change because they have a very strong position on it. The board is no. Currently, mm -hmm. the board mm -hmm. said it last time. <laughs> Not that they can't be persuaded, but it's going to be a tough sell. And if they have the sales pitch and they have the kind of informed plan, that might be something better. Okay. But just letting you know, that's where the board stands on that. Okay. Um, <coughs> something, that I, something that I think is important to say is I even asked the students I met with, I was like, where do you think the responsibility, responsibility is in terms of finding a new, a new funding? Do you think it is? The students or do you think it is admin and they kind of like sat back for a sec they're like i think it's a collaborative effort so yes i agree i don't think the demands should be shouted with no hey look at this hey what about this i agree with that but i i don't think that it's all on the students and i don't, I don't think either. it's all on admin either. i don't either yes but it needs it needs to come they need to come at that approach because the person that came out last semester was very exclusive okay. and stuff like that which okay. did not make the board want to move though so, <coughs> the only board in the nation that met with the protesters cu denver did not extend that courtesy to their students so keep that in mind we have a pretty yes. progressive board thank you. Here. Thank you. how yeah. open is how open is the board on getting new funding resources oh that's they're always right. open on getting new funding resources we're always one of the community partners mm -hmm. so let's say we come up with a couple partners that would like to, you know, at least come and talk to them. Would they be open or would they still like, they'd be like performative like they were last year with SDS where they just gave the documents and stuff like that? What do you mean by that? I guess 
you knew the position, you knew the position, they weren't gonna change their position, but they still gave documents and stuff. So that make it a bigger issue here though. And I don't, I don't want that to be an issue here. Like we, I wanna be able to have the opportunity to actually, actually do it, not just, oh, maybe, or like, you know, like a shrug of the shoulder is what I'm talking about from the board. Well, what the board needs to see is the collective of students agree on this. And that's what the part I think honestly was missing is because SDS does not represent mm -hmm. all the students on this campus. Mm -hmm. it's, it was 100 students in the quad for our own We have almost 90,000 students mm -hmm. in the school. And I don't know how, God knows how many in that engineering building people go for the actual engineering program. If the board can be convinced, it's going to be from like people within that building and the students as a whole. That's what's going to convince the board because they have a fiduciary agreement. We all signed it to do good by university and just cutting funds kind of on the whim of a demand it, that goes against that agreement. Valid. Super valid. Um, but okay. it's a longer conversation. I've been in these trenches for a while. Yeah. yeah. I think you, you, have, you don't have a lot more expertise in those situations. Mm -hmm. And trauma. No, I'm, I'm sorry about that, Mike. Um, are, I hear folks packing up. Can I just see a show of hands of people who are interested in working in some capacity on this? Thing? So I can shoot you an email. That's the council. Oh. That's the council. Yay. There you go. Okay, that made my day, guys. Thank you so much. That's it for me. You want to close it off? Yeah. It is. 106. 106. Um, I motion that we end this meeting. Sorry, okay. Opposed? Any abstentions? Cool. The meeting is a drink. Awesome. Thank you. I have to. I have to go to work. Let's do some next week. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to be back. I was supposed to. Is there any timeline at all for?